Do you all have last week's paper? Very, very good. Because I intend to finish, we're on number 32, Five Ways God Orchestrates Extinction. But before we begin that, John Neifert is a fossil collector. And John asked me, he said, you think people would enjoy seeing some of my fossils? And so John, we'll want you to, that's how we're gonna start. And then if people get bored with my lecture, they can look at the fossils, right? But that's wonderful, you tell us about them. And uh, then we're going to go into where did all the water of the flood come from? That's gonna be our topic tonight. Let us pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful for the fellowship of saints. So thankful that your word and your spirit through our life affects us so positively, giving us wisdom, giving us understanding, giving us that wonderful faith that your word is true. May our study this evening confirm our faith, strengthen our faith, so that you are glorified and that we can defend what we believe. In Jesus' name, amen. John, would you like to talk about your fossils? Sure. I've got about a dozen fossils over here since we've been talking about fossils. Um, Right, various different ones. Um, a lot of these are ones that I've picked up at rock shops and different things as we travel. Um, there's a few of these um, that we found, um, even found locally. Um, right, uh, so um, I'm not going to talk through every one of these, but um, this is the one that's not a fossil, it's, it's just a rock, uh, but it's a crystal structure. It's really neat to kind of see how it shimmers and changes colors. As, as Did you out. find that around here? No. Okay. That's one I purchased <laughs> in Iowa. <coughs> okay. Um, you've got uh, crocodile teeth here. Um, you've got a, a, a tooth, which I did find. Um, you know, I didn't purchase that one. That's one I found. You found it's, that tooth? Yes. Um, it's clearly a tooth. Um, it's kind of Is that around the Oddly, you found it? No. No. Okay. Uh, just in our, in our travels. Um, the one I wanted to call out uh, specifically, you know, to the topic of um, our, our uh, lessons here, too, is this trilobite. So this is a testament to creation, right? It goes against the evolutionary thinking, right? Because this is a trilobite, which is in, found in the lowest layers of rocks, um, right? Which the, the, the story from the evolutionist says that the lower down, the older they are, and life forms went from the simplest to the most complex. So these are supposed to be the the simplest um, organisms, living organisms. Um, one of the things that Verl and I did, um, she did some research to how to tell from a, a true fossil from a fake fossil, um, is the, the very fine detail, because you can't fake very fine de detail with a cast. Um, so part of that shows that these, this trilobite has compound eyes. You, you look at it really closely, there's lots of little, 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 little <laughs> eyes in there, right? Compound eyes are not simple. Wow. So that's that's part of the story I tell with this one, but um, it, it's really fascinating to, to look at that and, and think about it. Yeah. So which one is the dinosaur teeth? Um, I'm not sure what type of tooth it is, but it's this tooth here, right? Okay. So you see a... Um, kind of a white piece, and then the enamel um, behind it is rock. Wow. So um, it's it's a little brittle. So mm -hmm. um, that one. Um, you know, say have teeth, right? Are those? The, this is um, like a, a crocodile-like creature, right? With the you know you have the the mouth and then the, the teeth in there as well. Did you find or buy that? I bought this one. Okay. Um, this is one I found near Lake Red Rock. Um, this is, I hate to say confirmed, but um, it's uh, by a scientist friend of mine, Rob Carter, who's going to be here later this year. <coughs> he said, 
um, that is very possibly a dinosaur egg, right? So you see the hard stuff here, this lighter colored uh, pieces, you know, brittle, some of it's fallen off and stuff like that, but uh, wow. it looks like the shell a shell of dinosaur egg, egg. maybe. Um, there are a lot of fossils around Lake Red Rock. Um, I can kind of tell you where we found uh, some, but they're, they're not hard to find. I was gonna bring, um, there's tree roots, and I think her mom has one that's about 18 inches long. A tree uh, root 18 inches long? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, but they, they are very frequent on the northwest side of um, Red Rock, over there by the, the tower, if you go out to the the beach area, and you can find lots of different fossils there. So. And the bike trail goes right there now, too, yeah. right? <clears throat> yeah. And so, what is that fancy one way over there? This one? Over there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember what they're Ortho. Ceres? <laughs> Orthoceros, right? So it's a um, um, kind of like a squid like creature, and they, they live inside the shell, so they've kind of polished up around the, the shell. These are very common. You can almost never see one by itself. You can see them in groups like this. Um, but so it, has it been polished is why it looks so nice? Yes. Yeah, okay. this one's been polished. So you see it's chipped. You know, the, the rough stuff around here has been chipped. You see the kind of back chipped around. Uh, but then they, they take the part where they find the, the fossil shell and then they kind of polish that. Wow. Out. So, and you got, uh, just like you've shown in some of the slides, um, a couple fish on this little plate here. Show that. There's one here that's darker, there's a lighter one over here. Uh, but you guys can come up and look at these you know, closer later too. Uh, and what is this shell right here? This is an ammonite. Um, so it's a it's a spiral shell. Um, right? You know, here's a smaller one where you have both, you know, fully intact where this this bit of cross section, so you can kind of see inside of it. Um, you see some cavities. Lots of them have been filled in through the fossilization process and, and stuff like that. But and I do have the other half of this one, so you see them coming together. Uh, but it's all polished up. Um, you see the, the variation in the, in the cost, the, the colors, and um, all sorts of different things here. But this one is a milky marble um, in Utah. It, it's basically a you know. Um, a speck of dirt or sand or something, and then um, stuff's formed around it, and it's really hard. It's really, really hard. I think it's uh, volcanic material. Yeah, I think it's yeah. like multiple splashes there. Yep. Something like that. <coughs> and then just a, a simple sea urchin. Also, that's a sea urchin. Yeah. Yep. I'll see it as you get closer. Um, right. If, if you dated these, um, you know, they'd probably be millions of years old, but they look just like the ones you see today. <laughs> So, um, this one is just simply rock too. I uh, found at Lake Red Rock. Um, you look in close, there's really shiny, sparkly veins within in there. Which, if you polish this up, I don't have a rock polisher, but if you polish that up, it would look really good. But there's a ton of those over at Red Rock too, in the right spot. Our next class will be at Red Rock. <laughs> 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 Any question for John? Do you find very many Indian fossils or Indian arrowheads and such like? Um, not a lot. We actually found some on our property. Um, we've got you know, a really small <laughs> trickle that goes into Robert's Creek. Um, we, we did find one down um, like three there. Down. We found three down there. Okay. Yeah. John lives west of Otley, is where he Thank you, John. You're welcome. And most of those things were killed in the flood, right? right? Wow. This is the final slide I showed you last week. Why did I show you these, these pictures? What is this demonstrating to you? Ken Den. Caden. You're Caden. Yes. There's been no evolutionary, evolutionary change throughout time. You are perfectly right. As John said a while ago, what we see today and what we see in the fossil record is unchanged. Fossils defend 
the scripture defend that God created kinds and those kinds continue to this day all of these fossils whether they want to say there are millions of years we know they have to be around 5,000 years old there is no change between the present animal and the past now here's the question a biblical view of extinction and that is number 32 on your paper in his wisdom God has ordained for some kinds of species of animals to become extinct throughout the history of the earth. You would agree with that statement, right? God has ordained it. Nothing happens without God's ordaining it, causing it to happen. So I have this question, A, did the flood bring about the extinction of any kind of animal? No. No, because? No, to two of each kind of animal onto the earth. I love your answer. Mo Noah, God brought two of every kind to Noah. Noah didn't have to run around and try to lasso the monkey and get him in the ark. God brought there's another, another way that you and I can look at election. God chose the two cats, the two dogs, the two whatever of each kind, kind of animal. The cat kind, what would be involved in the cat kind if I'm talking about cats? Lions. Lions. Panthers. Panthers. Tiger. Come on, everybody. Cheetahs. Cheetahs. Tigers. Tigers. Leopards. Leopards. Mm -hmm. Elephants. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how about your little Wait. pussy cat that you have around the house? Right? <laughs> Those are cats. There were only two cats on the ark. Kind. Next question. Did the flood bring about the extinction of any species of animal? Now, what's the difference between a kind and a species? A species is a variation of a kind. You are right. A species is a variation of a kind. You just named various species of cats lions, tigers, and so on and so forth. So is B yes or no? Yes. We assume that there are species of animals which we no longer have today because they were brought to extinction in the flood. The various species we have today in our world are from the two cats, two dogs, whatever you're talking about. And uh, we'll get more deeply into this when we talk about how all the animals fit on the ark. But that is true. No kind of animal is missing. Every kind was on the ark. Species, there are, we assume, missing. Okay. Five ways God orchestrates extinction today. One of them is disease that can wipe out total kinds, total species. What is another way God ordains, carries out the extinction of a species of animal? Henry. Nomination. What do you mean by that? Well, maybe one is stronger than the other, so they, they pray upon it. Or, or I think you're perfectly right, and I'm not sure that's the next one here. It is. Predators. Predators can wipe out a 
species wipe out a kind. And parasites, I throw that in with the predators because both of those can wipe out a kind of animal, species of animal. What's another way? I think I have five of them. Joe? I like your answer. I'm not sure it's the next one, but Okay, natural catastrophes would work in that, right? When you have floods, when you have volcanoes, when you have earthquakes, when you have famines, all of those God can use to wipe out a certain species of animal, a certain kind of animal. You know, the dinosaur kind, we have none of them, as far as we know. Uh, were they wiped out by disease? Were they wiped out by predators? Uh, by natural catastrophes? And, Joe, you're probably talking also um, how agriculture can destroy habitat of, a, of an animal that used to live in a certain area, or the building of cities, and so on and so forth. Any other way you can think of? Yes, sir. Uh, maybe genetic incompatibility. What do you mean by that? Uh, so with the African cheetah right now, they have such a small population that um, the males and females aren't able to, they, won't, they don't correctly mate as well as they used to, so litter size are decreasing, there's more birth de defects, so less cheetahs are being born and that could eventually lead to extinction. You added number six to this, which I don't have, and I agree with you. <laughs> Interbreeding can reduce a population. Uh, the inability to compete with other species. There's only a certain amount of food in a certain area. And if that amount of food is eaten, consumed by other species, then we're going to lose a species. I think this is happening now in the Everglades with the introduction of uh, different species, different kinds of animals. You have the pythons, which are not native to the Everglades, and uh, that, that takes over. And finally, human hunting, agriculture, and so on, is going to be another way that God ordains for the extinction of different species. I got some pictures for you younger students, and we older ones love them also. Uh, but I first wanted to give you Romans 8, 19 to 21. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We look at a creation that is under a curse. Understand that. You and I are the cause of that. Man's sin brings on the suffering in the creation. And so here you have it. Can somebody tell me what lions ate prior to zebras on the menu? Joshua? Um, they, they, they were the zebras running, the lions were, they were two lions were going to eat. You see that zebra? Mm -hmm. They're going to eat it. That's a sad picture. But before, when God created lions, cats, big cats, what did they eat? Vegetables. You are right. They ate <coughs> grass, they ate plants, they ate seeds. Their character changes because of sin in the world. Here's another one. 
Here you have some pretty skinny animals, right? Again, Joshua? Thank you, that's what they are. But you see the suffering in the world. Here's another one. This elephant has died. And a mother elephant will mourn for her dead baby. It's really amazing. Here you have the flood. Here's a lion. See how they carry their young ones? Trying to find a place. Here's another one. This time of the year. It's very difficult in Iowa for the animals to find food. And so some are going to die off. They don't become extinct here, but they do die off. And here's your drought. You're not going to be able to find the food they need. Earthquakes. And this is an interesting picture. Uh, St. George the Dragon Slayer. It's a story of St. George killing a dragon in the year 303 A.D. What does A.D. mean? Adam. Okay, uh, the year of our Lord is what it means. And so uh, dragons seemingly lived not that long ago. All right. Now there's something else. Uh, this is what Ivan sent me last week, and it was on Fox News, and I think you need to be aware of this. It says, S. Joshua, Joshua, here you go, Joshua, Swamidis, an associate professor at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Here's what he's saying. And the title of this article on Fox News was Christians Point to Genetic Breakthroughs to Show Adam and Eve Are Not Incompatible with Evolution. Incompatible, boys and girls, means uh, if you're incompatible, means you don't fit together. You, you can't get along together. And this man is saying, no, Adam and Eve and evolution, they can fit together. January 2, 2022. For over 160 years, the societal conflict, societal boys and girls means in our world where we have these arguments in our society, the conflict over evolution has been deep and stubborn. But now in a surprise twist, evolutionary science is making space for Adam and Eve. It turns out that the theological question are about genealogical ancestry, not genetics. Now, this is going to throw you off. What's the difference between genealogical and genetics? Because we all have both. Genealogical would be your family tree? That's right. Genealogical is your family <coughs> tree. You go back... You all have two parents. How many grandparents do you have? How many? Four. And how many great-grandparents? Four. Be careful. Eight. Eight. How many great-great-grandparents? Sixteen. Sixteen. And how many great-great-great? Thirty-two. And then we'll stop there. See, your genealogical history now, what's your genetic history? Of what traits have been passed down through them? Correct. When every conception, there is 50% of the traits come from the mother and 50% come from the father. And that's, we say, well, you look just like your mom or you look just like your dad. And that's because there are these traits. But 
50% of the traits that your dad possesses, you never got. And 50% of the traits your mother possesses, you never received. But your brother and your sisters, they maybe have some of your same traits, but they probably have many different ones, and that's why we can tell the difference between you, because of your genetics, the traits. And so, geo, your genealogy is your ancestry. Genetics is the characteristics that have been passed down to you from the generations. And so it is possible that you have some of the traits of your great-great-grandfather. It's very, very possible. But the farther you get back, the, the amount of that is going to decrease. And so he says, most readers of Genesis understood Adam and Eve to be one, ancestors of us all, and two, miraculously created without parents of their own. We agree with that, right? Every young, Adam and Eve, we're all related. In contrast, he says, evolution teaches that, and he numbered this number three, I copied it the way he said it, we share common ancestors with apes, and we arise from a large population not a single couple. Would you go along with that second paragraph? No. We'll agree with the first one. The second one, that we have ancestors that are apes. You can trace back your history, and you're going to have apes in your history. And, and that we have uh, come from a large population, not a single couple. This conflict of fact only seemed solvable. That means how do you put Adam and Eve with apes and so on? By revising foundational Christian theological beliefs. <coughs> and that's what many people in the church have done. They just say, we'll just change how we understand Genesis. We will, we'll just, we have to reinterpret Genesis or by rejecting evolution. You and I reject evolution. We have not joined those who have revised the scripture. But now, this man says, Swamidis, but now clearly, but now clearing up some big scientific understandings, we know that all four of these can be true at the same time. Are you scratching your head yet? I think this is very dangerous, God. Even if Adam and Eve lived as recently as just 6,000 years ago, this man seems to know what we believe about the Bible, they would be the genealogical ancestors of everyone across the globe by the year A.D. 1. He says, we would say 1 A.D. What he means by that is, as I just talked to you, you know, you have 32 great, great, great grandparents, and you have 64, and then 128. What he is saying, Adam and Eve are the parents of everybody that exists. Because by the year 1 A.D., you would have such a spread that their genetics would be in the whole population. That's what he's saying. They could have been created from the dust and a rib. He's got no problem with that. You want to believe that? That's okay. You're welcome to come in to what? We believe we can put it all together. But he says, of course, at the same time, we would also descend from people outside the garden. Were there people outside the garden? No. 
Are you sure? You're sure. Others whom God created by providentially, look at those words, created, providentially, he's speaking our language, right? Governed process of evolution. Or have you heard that before? You've heard that in what we call theistic evolution. God created using the evolutionary model, but he's got his fingers in it and he's controlling it. And so he says, uh, his model of a genealogical Adam and Eve, and he calls it a G-A-E, claims that biological humans may still share a common ancestor with apes, according to the theory of evolution, but God could have created Adam and Eve from the dust in a rib without parents, and these two became the ancestors of all human beings by 1 AD, which means every one of us, we have Adam and Eve's genetics, but we have ape genetics also. You don't look like you're all excited about that. <laughs> so, I mean, it's claims that Genesis appears to require biological humans outside of Adam and Eve's family line. Because after Cain murders Abel and leaves <coughs> his parents, he fears that he will be killed. By who? <laughs> by brothers and sisters see and, you know you uh, many people think Adam and Eve had three sons Cain Abel Seth and then you say well where did Cain get his wife he married his sister Joshua you gave the perfect answer when you read <laughs> Genesis chapter 5, verse 4. And, and Adam and Eve had many other sons and daughters. You and I are just given the information about Abel, Cain and Abel and with Seth. He fears that he will be killed. He acquires a wife and he builds a city. Understand, Adam and Eve had many children. How many? We don't know. How old did Adam get to be? 930. 930. How long was he able to reproduce? We don't know. But did he have 100 kids? 200 kids? And they would have children? Uh, many, many people believe that by the time of Noah's flood, which was the year 1656, I think, years after the creation, there would have been millions of people living on the earth because they lived so long and they had a reproduction uh, time of, of, of hundreds of years, not decades. Did you find that interesting? I think it was wonderful. You still have your post-test around? You got it? Shall we go through it a bit? Um, some of you that were not here, I'll give you a post test. Let's see, I'm going to share some over there with people. You can share these together. Wes, are you taking the post test? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who else needs a post test? Did you lose your paper, Richard? You never did. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Number one, fossils can tell us some things about the climate of the past, and everybody said? True. True. 
Two, fossils can help us understand a few things about what life on the earth was like before there were any written records, and everybody said? True. True. Every fossil is the actual remains of a once living plant or animal? True. I failed. It's false. There are some, like the amber that we saw last week, insects and amber, that is the real animals uh, things there. But some of these that John has here, they have, uh, you know, a fossil, they have become mineralized. Uh, you have your petrified fossils. Number four, most fossils are of dinosaurs. False. There are six kinds of fossils. True. Some fossils are the actual shells or bones of animals. True. Some fossils are mineral replicas of the original organism. True. Some fossils are an empty mold where the original organism died and decayed. True. Some fossils are a cast in which minerals precipitated. That means they collected and filled up the mold, creating an exact mineral replica of the original organism? True, you're doing well. Some fossils are of organisms which were smashed flat and decayed, leaving only an exact carbon print of their original shape and size? True, and John has one of those of the fish. We go to 11. Some fossils are of tracks and eggs of the original organism, but the original organ, not, it should say, not the original organism itself, and that would be true. Number 12. Any fossilized remains of an organism that is less than a millimeter in size is not considered to be a fossil. That's false. Most organisms fossilize after they die. That's a great big false. Very few animals fossilize. They have to be covered. Igneous rock. I'm, I'm sorry, here we go. Fossilization requires the organism to have been immediately and completely and permanently buried in sediment while it was alive or at the moment of its death. True. That's why most organisms do not fossilize. They're not covered up. Fifteen, most fossils are found in sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock is sediment. It's that settles on the bottom of the ocean, on the bottom of a lake or river. And so that's true. Sedimentary rock is going to have your fossils. Igneous rock that comes from volcanic rock. Igneous means fire. Igneous rocks contain the most fossils. That's false. There are very, 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 very few fossils in igneous rocks. They'd be burned up. Some fossils are found in hardened tree sap. True. True. We saw them last week. Some fossils are found in ice and frozen ground. True. That would be the mammoth. Uh, some fossils are found in tar pits. True, we saw that last week. And some fossils are older than Adam. That is false. Thank you very much. We have lesson eight that we're going to get started on here, and I need somebody to pass some papers out. Adam and Kenan, would you be so kind as to do it? Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And we'll just put these up here. <coughs> you boys are really helpful. Uh, Joe? I just have a question. If there were thousands of humans by the time of the flood, could we find human fossils? We don't. Yeah, we find them, but not to the extent that we find other fossils. If I am correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, if you go uh, just Google <coughs> human fossils, you will find pictures of human fossils. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate your question. So where did all the water come from? Joshua. The creation, when he created the world with water. That created water was the water that God used for the flood. Who says Joshua nailed the lesson? We're finished with this lesson. How many times has the earth been flooded? Raise your fingers. Some of you say one. Or totally flooded or? Totally flooded. <laughs> Some of you say two. I'm actually going to go through. If you say one, when was it flooded? During Noah's flood. <laughs> Noah's flood. If you say two, creation. Creation. Day two of the creation. Creation. Give me the Bible verse that proves your answer. Yes. I really am impressed with your kids' answers. I really, really like them. Where does it say the earth was flooded? Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Verse two. Read it loud and clearly. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was covering over the waters. The earth is covered with water. That's very significant. The first time the earth was flooded was at creation. Remember that. The second time would be Noah's flood. All right? So Joshua, you really opened the door for us. You are correct. The waters that God created at the beginning are the same waters that are going to cover the earth. And now people have another question. Where was that water after, you know, where the dry land appeared? Where does that water? What happens to it? Kenan? It was in the ground. It was up. in the ground. Who says this boy nailed it? Zeke, you got it right. You got it right. Is there water under the ground today? <coughs> Is there more water on top of the ground or under the ground? Under the ground. There is more water under the ground than there is in the oceans. Isn't that amazing? Just amazing. All right. 
So we better do our little pretest. I'm looking at the clock here. Uh, I just want you to know that these are the websites I use. So, got your pencils? Fill in the first blank. God created earth with enough water to flood the whole earth. You got it? The surface of earth was covered with water on day one of creation week. Number three, the flood is actually the second time earth was covered with water. Four, dry land first appears on the third day of creation week. Number five, God raised up the dry land above the surface of the water. Did he lift up land? <coughs> Number seven, there was more land than water on earth before the flood. Number eight. Did I skip six? Thank you for correcting me. Thank you. When the dry land appeared, that's number five as the land goes up. When the dry land appeared, some water went inside earth. Then number seven, there was more land than water on earth before the flood. Eight, the fountains of the deep, which opened up during the flood, was the water which had gone inside earth on day three of creation week. Nine, the moisture in the atmosphere at the time of the flood was enough to produce the rain needed to cover earth. What that means is there is enough moisture in the atmosphere that it could rain for 40 days and 40 nights and cover the earth to the extent that God describes it covered. Number 10, the word flood used in Genesis, in the, the Hebrew word for it, but we say flood, used in Genesis actually means deep water. You may use your Bible, that's not a problem. Number 11, if Noah had looked out the window of the ark after the 40 days and nights of rain, he would have seen quiet blue water. Interesting. You think about these this week because it's not worth opening up the uh, the whole thing for this part, and and we'll take off there. Uh, we can just talk about these. So what is the place of Noah's flood in the world of science today? When what do you think people think about Noah's flood? Is it historical? Is it accepted as historic? No, it is considered, we'll get into more detail next week, it's considered myth. How many cultures that we have found have a flood story in them? Every one of them. 
Every one of them. Would you like to, to, to see some of those? I will share them with you. The Aztecs, the Incas, all of the, the cultures we have ever found, all through Asia, there is a flood story. And some of them are similar to the creation, to the Genesis account. Some of them are a little far-fetched. But there is a flood story. There's also a Tower of Babel story in almost every culture. Did you know that? <coughs> and, and there's a language and the God was angry. and God gave them different languages so they couldn't understand each other. Why would those stories be in every culture? <coughs> Joshua? They happened. And Noah would have told, you know, and his, his sons, they would tell their children, that's a story that's going to get passed down. Who's going to continue to pass down the story of the Tower of Babel? The children of those, the children. Children of, of those who were affected by it. And so this is going to be a really interesting class in the next week or so. I want to thank all of you for coming out, and we will pick it up next week. Let us pray together. Our Father, we're so blessed again to have fellowship together, food together, to study your word together. It's just so interesting how you have designed and prepared all things in this creation to carry out your <coughs> sovereign will. We pray for your blessing on each of us. And we, we return again next week. May you be praised in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope to see you next week.